Good afternoon, welcome to another A Push video with Mr. Paid for Barlow High School. Today we're looking at the topic of early industrialization. And there are a lot of different ingredients that help the United States transform to what they would call a market economy. That term means that the people who are producing things have a market to sell it to. A market that allows them to produce more instead of just enough to barter with their friends or neighbors or, you know, sell to a few people in their community. The, po the possibility of producing a large amount and selling it regionally or nationally or globally really explodes with early industrialization, as does the creation of a factory system. How do we get all of this to happen? That's what we're going to explore in the next few minutes. Immigrants. Cheap labor is an important ingredient in having a factory system work. And they don't need to be necessarily that skilled. Uh, the podcast, you hear a description of this, of why they don't have to be that skilled, because you're seeing a transformation from artisans who were in the guild system to basically unskilled people who can just do a repetitive task with the machine over and over and over. Immigrants are drawn to the United States for two reasons. One, for jobs, because there weren't jobs available. They are escaping political oppression. They are escaping the potato famine in Ireland. Um, by the time you get to the 1840s, and people are going to be coming here just for better opportunities. Better opportunities than they had in Europe. Factories offered a better opportunity for some people than what they had because of the competition to get a factory job in Europe. Free land, of course, was the marquee draw. People that would be able to get land out in the Old Northwest or the Old Southwest, as we refer to them, or later on in Louisiana Territory to the west of the Mississippi, this was an uh, impossible hope in Europe. There was no chance of it. You could save money for generations in a family and never afford land because no one would sell it because it's such a precious commodity and there's such a limited supply. But there's an ample supply here. So people are going to move with the hope of one day owning their own land and work in the East. And we see that happening. Immigrants provide the labor that's going to fuel this market economy once it gets going. Okay, so let's understand, what is the economy like in 1820? Well, there's a couple of things. You have a few large cities. You had four large cities, essentially. You have Charleston and, and some northern cities such as Philadelphia, Boston, and New York. You just don't have that large of a population anywhere. And what you're going to see is that, really, it wasn't too different than it had been in 1790. But by 1840, you're going to see dynamic change due to the events that we're about to go through. So the economy is going to transform from just a few little factories and this artisan guild system still in place to basically an interregional economy with uh, growing amounts of different dynamic characteristics to it. So the problem of why the economy was not really transforming, why we're lagging in the United States at this time be, uh, behind, the great, uh, behind Great Britain and their industrial prowess and their industrial revolution, Basically, the, the problem is transportation. By 1820, it still took uh, more money to transport a good 30 miles across land than it did to sail from Europe. Now, you think about that, but think about how much a horse-drawn wagon or something could hold of a product versus the massive container space of a, a large ship and the, the cost and problem of traversing, say, the Appalachian Mountains or just going somewhere was very difficult. Why was it so difficult? The, the transportation system is terrible. Uh, one major example of this is roads. Roads, the situation is quite desperate whenever you have bad parts of the year uh, weather-wise, which in some places would be six months or more, any road would be turned to slop. If you've ever played soccer or football or something on a grass field, I know turf is kind of what things are moving toward these days, but if you ever played that on uh, a grass field and it gets really muddy, I mean it can just be just a sloppy mud, mud fest, you know, it's just a, it's a mess out there. Well imagine if you had a horse and people and a wagon full of commodities or wagons trying to get through this, this muck of mud. Very difficult to imagine that that would be very successful. So transportation is very difficult and basically what, what happens is, you know, 1790 you get Samuel Slater, 1810 or so you get Francis Cabot Lowell and the Boston Manufacturing Company, and you start to have more of these industrial factory groups that can manufacture textile goods popping up in the New England area, okay? But the problem is the incentive. The, a couple of groups it works for to get in early because they can sell to areas that are close to them in big cities in the Northeast. But what about 
trying to sell nationally or regionally. It's very difficult and there's no incentive to produce more because transportation is so bad. There are some other problems. Rivers, they only flowed downstream and uh, Abraham Lincoln as a young man would ride a flatboat and he was one of these guys they called flat boatmen that they would ride kind of this like makeshift junk raft of junk wood with product, big old flat thing, they'd ride it down the river to New Orleans and then they'd have to like ride a horse or get a ride somehow back up and do the process again because none of these junk boats went upstream they turned into kindling basically for fire. So farmers, same thing. Farmers had to live very close to the tributaries coming in uh, in the south or they had to live very close to a river or else basically all they could do was locally produce and, and barter trade with their neighbors. The ability to produce on a larger scale and specialize in one product or crop didn't really exist because they didn't have a fast or efficient or cost effective way to get things shipped. So what's going to happen? Farms and factories lack the incentive to produce on a larger scale and you know we're going to see what gives them this in a minute. So roads. So the, the desire of the American system which we talked about on I believe the last podcast we talked about the Maysville Road veto. You have a desire to uh, have the national government get involved in these things such as the Maysville Road. But it is, it is going to be vetoed by Jackson because it is an interstate project. But you know what? As much as the Whigs want to have internal improvements uh, as part of one of the three ingredients to the American system along with tariffs and the National Bank, as much as they want to have that happen, you are not going to see the national government level spending any money on these programs. As a matter of fact, what you're going to see for roads is they're either going to be done by state governments or sometimes in a corporate manner through something we call a turnpike. Now you may have heard of that term today and not understand what it is, but a turnpike essentially meant they'd have a road they could close and had spikes sticking out so you couldn't go through it, and then you'd pay them a fee to the people who had built the road, and then you could use the road. And the idea, you know, it's like a toll road today, okay? The idea is you could cover all of your costs and the maintenance and make a profit if you were willing to put up the road and then offer this toll system. States sometimes do it, sometimes corporate. Roads, uh, there are not too many roads of major significance. This is the National or Cumberland Road. You can see it goes all the way from Maryland to the Mississippi. Um, it's very significant, and it had kind of a, a crack in the Appalachian Mountains, which of course come right down here, where you could come through and, you know, it actually it, it bisects through with lots of canals as well. So that was a very significant road through kind of the middle of the, the north, but other than that, not very many significant roads. I have a couple labeled on the map there. Steamboats. Okay, steamboats versus the flatboat system. They basically took something that would be a 10-day trip and made it a one-day trip, that would be a $10 trip and made it a $1 trip. So it's a 90% savings to use steamboats. And of course, one of the big advantages is not only are they far faster coming down the rivers, they're far they're able to go up, unlike the flatboats or anything else that had ever been used they could go up river. Another great advantage is they, um, the bottom is kind of like a saucer, it's very flat and so they could navigate onto rivers and canal spaces uh, when canals are soon invented. They could navigate onto those because they, they were shallow bottomed and you know especially when you think about it, like if you have a time of drought and the water level drops they would be more able to uh, go through this than a boat with a, a deep hole that sat in the water deep. So steamboats are going to radically improve things in terms of saving a lot of money for um, transportation costs. Canals also saving costs. So the roads, by putting in roads which basically had crushed rock thrown down and pounded into them and the logs and trees and everything had been cleared out of the way, this makes transportation a little more efficient and a little bit more winter travel worthy. Steamboats dramatically save money on time and cost. So you're starting to see the incentive for farmers and factories appear. Canals. Canals are going to be a boom really from the early 1800s up until the Panic of 1837. After that, it becomes the railroads. Uh, once, you know, funding dries up during the Panic of 1837 for a while, and then when it comes back, it's all railroads. Uh, obviously, the Erie Canal, these are kind of dotted line canals I've got drawn here. Erie Canal is going to be the most significant one. It connects the Hudson River uh, right here to it, to the Great Lakes, 
and it's going to be chiefly responsible for New York City becoming the largest, most populous state today. Uh, later on, another canal that's going to connect right here where Chicago is, um, and eventually be able to dump it into the Mississippi River is going to help Chicago grow in prominence. Later, the Transcontinental Railroad will help Chicago become one of the most important and large cities that we have. So canals are going to offer, as most of these ro uh, rivers were north-south, it is going to offer some east-west connections in a variety of areas and connect Great Lakes, Mississippi River, and you have an east-west network that develops of the canals in large part. Um, now, you might see, you might be noting, might be very astute that I'm not drawing too much in the south. Were there a few canals in the south? Yes, there were. But most people in the south, they had this access to these tributaries with these large plantations that they could get their, um, essentially to a port, they could get their cotton production or tobacco production to sell it. So it's not as much of a necessity for southern farmers uh, to invest in roads or in uh, canals, although they have some. Railroads later, they have some, but not nearly as much. So canals, canals also, uh, national, that's kind of a theme. They're not really investing in this. You have some state, you have some investors who are going to be investing in building canals, hoping to make money off of the toll charges of everyone that used the canal. And one other beautiful feature about canals is, of course, canals could operate where you had high ground and low ground. So you know, if you have an area that um, you know, had a waterfall or you know, some kind of feature where it was going down, um, you could have build a lock and you know, basically the canal could operate and float boats up to go up, which would never have been possible before. So canals are going to um, dramatically open up uh, trade into the west. They're going to make it less expensive. Remember, you have the Mississippi over here, but really this entire kind of old northwest area all the way to the east coast is opening up with a lot more transportation options and cheaper ones as well. Railroads. So I'm not even drawing them in because as railroads come in, there's a few little squiggly lines of railroads in 1830. By 1840, it's growing. By 1850, it's like a spider web of the entire north and some limited examples in the south. Railroads, of course, while not as dramatic of an improvement as canals and steamboats, which really opened up transportation to places it had never been, they made it faster. Railroads could go 15 to 20 miles an hour. Some people actually questioned whether it was safe and, you know, whether human being body, human being's body could handle going 15 or 20 miles an hour if they could only see us today. Uh, but the railroad essentially is going to make it even faster. And because you don't have to worry about connecting waterways like a canal um, because they, you can lay track and it's not going to get swamped out by mud. It would take an awful lot of snow to stop a railroad. The railroads could go irrespective of geography and have a lot more options than, um, than basically a road could or a canal. So what is the result of all of this transportation revolution that occurs? Because reading your book, you might look at this and go, I have no idea like, why they're telling me all these things about transportation improvements. Here's how it all connects together. It's going to result in regional economic trade, basically the creation of markets. Markets for these people who needed that incentive. With the markets that you have spider-webbed railroads all across, and by the way, we're talking mostly a west-east connection, which is going to cement the west kind of tied culturally as time goes on, but economically tied to the northeast. During the Civil War, that'll of course be important, but you're going to see Farmers could be somewhere in today's, you know, Wisconsin or Michigan or Indiana, and they could trade something and move it pretty quickly. Produce that might go bad, um, or just the ability to inexpensively and quickly send a yield, a large yield of some other product. Farmers can specialize in all kinds of different products and know that as we have immigrants, as the population continues to increase, there's going to be a market. There are going to be people that want to buy the food or, or whatever those things are. So we have markets. So for farmers, they get larger markets to sell their food crops to, and it's easier to transport goods at a much more economical rate that makes it realistic for them. So farmers, instead of having a small family farm and producing for their family in a little bit to barter trade, farmers now will produce one crop, specialize, and produce a ton. Likewise, manufacturers. Manufacturers are going to uh, now have the ability, instead of only having a few manufacturers they're going to produce for the Northeast, you start to see along these transportation arteries, more and more uh, manufacturers pop up in Cincinnati or Cleveland or 
Detroit or Chicago, kind of spreading to the Old Northwest. And again, because of the, the rail lines, the canals, the steamboats, their markets are wherever they want to send them to. So even without national support, which it'll be necessary later on for like the Transcontinental Railroad, and it'll happen with the Republicans during the Civil War, you're able to see the interregional economy that was dreamed of by um, Henry Clay and others. This is going to kind of be uh, realized. It is much less, much less uh, west-south than it is east-west, but there is an element of the south mixed in there, of course, as well. And interregional trade develops, new large cities are developed, and the market economy takes off and explodes. That's all the time we have for today. Stay classy, Sam.